So we already did that slide, so we don't have to do it. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, point out what our dream is. This is, and as you hear me speak today, you'll realize we're pretty far from that dream. Um, so we're interested in settings in which you, the person using the mobile device, thank you, um, really wants to improve, has some long-term goal. You, you want to maybe manage your weight better. You want to become more physically active. Uh, you want, might want to manage your stress. You're trying to recover from an addiction and so on. So it's, this slide is from that viewpoint. That's very different from an elderly person who's severely disabled and you're trying to help them. It's an entirely different kind of setup. So here the goal is to help you achieve and maintain your long-term behavior. And in a sense, we have all these in-the-moment contingencies that we have to deal with, and they prevent us from achieving what we want to do to stay on track to uh, achieve our long-term behavior. And if the intervention on the phone can help you uh, overcome these in-the-moment contingencies, or that would be great. Uh, and furthermore, because the phone is always with you, and it can... Uh, it can interrupt you at any given time, so it becomes very intrusive. We want an intervention that will be there when you need it, but recedes back into the background when you don't. Um, so I'm going to talk, the setting that we're interested in, it's quite different from uh, many people who are working in um, CS. It's, uh, it's about clinical population. So we don't tend to have large sample sizes, and we're running studies, uh, and they are expensive. Uh, and also, uh, the, you have to tie, when you have an expensive study, you not only want to learn, you might not only want to do machine learning, but you also have to uh, uh, adapt to the needs of your collaborators. So uh, the behavioral scientists, they have goals too. And so these studies have to both help them inform their science as well as ours. Now today I'm going to focus mainly, mainly on experimental design, but you're going to see how there's compromises. You have to allow both sides to come together when you run these kinds of studies. Okay, so we're going to... Uh, in mobile health, there's two types of interventions you see, uh, you normally see, and we're going to focus on the push intervention, but I'll just discuss them briefly. So a pull, normally most mobile interventions have a whole variety of pulls, and in fact, all of the ones I'll show you are of that type. These are where the individual, the user decides, I need help right now. They go to the intervention, and they look for that help. Uh, pushes are very different. Pushes, they interrupt you. We push intervention or treatment to you. So they may ping, the phone may ping, it may uh, light up, and uh, often a notification occurs on your phone, or uh, in other cases, the notification may appear on your wristband. So you could have a push delivered via the wristband as well. We're going to focus today on pushes, and I think that's where the low-hanging fruit is, because pushes can be so intrusive, and you really don't want to push any more than you must. Um, so the way a behavioral scientist might state this, they'll say, well, I want to understand in what settings and at what times this treatment should be pushed to the user. That, of course, is a sequential decision-making problem, right? But there's two sides to that. You both want to inform your be the behavioral science as well as developing a policy that would, learn, that would help you understand in what setting when do I, and when do I provide a treatment? So there's both of these are operating all the time. And that has to do with the expense of these studies, at least partially. So this is a conceptual version of the data. It's not quite right because there, there's many different time scales in actuality. But I just want to point out that this uh, proximal response, this is what we're going to use in order to decide what type of treatment or whether to provide a push. These are all pushes, whether to provide them or what type to provide. We look at the proximal response in order to decide whether or not it was useful. So this is the first of uh, several studies. This study is already uh, finished. Um, it had a, a wearable wristband, in this case it was a jawbone, um, and then uh, we collected sensor data off the phone only six times because of the battery issues. We were using the user's own phone for this. Um, 
And then uh, some daily self-report. That's where we ask questions to the user. There were two types of interventions at two different time scales in this particular uh, study, these um, push interventions. Uh, there was one activity planning that you could be prompted to do in the evening to plan your activity for the next day. Or there was in the moment, in the middle of the day, you could be given a little suggestion about what you might do to become more active. This study involved uh, sedentary office workers. It's in preparation for the next study, which involves people who had heart attacks. So, but this was a first study to work on the, the software. So the, I wanted to show you an example of a little treatment that one could get. Here's a, a notification. These are always tailored. They're tailored to the time of the day, where you are, whether you're at home or work. They're tailored to uh, how the weather is outside, whether it's a weekend or a weekday. So this one came in the morning uh, on a work day. And so you can see it's a suggestion about how you might behave as you uh, bring yourself to work. Um, there's ways you can wipe off this notification. You can press thumbs down, the notification goes away, you didn't like it. You can press thumbs up, the notification goes away and you thought it was useful. So very unobtrusive approaches to uh, attempting to pr uh, collect burden uh, and perceived utility. So here's the second study. This study will go into the field uh, either end of April or May. Uh, so we're right in the middle of this, and you're going to see this later on. We're, we, we're, we changed the wristband because we're also getting heart rate now. Uh, and now we're going to have a whole variety of different pushes we might provide. And I listed some here. There's a morning greeting. This particular app has a coach on it, and the coach has a morning greeting session with you, and he has an evening. He or she has an evening greeting session. This is an automated coach. Um, the two things that we're going to focus on today, though, are uh, activity suggestions, similar to the one I showed you on the prior slide, as well as uh, an anti-sedentary message. Notice, again, the different time scales of these different types of pushes, very different time sc scales, daily, uh, at five-minute intervals, five times a day, and so on. Uh, this is the last study I just wanted to mention. This is a much more investigational study because of the wearables uh, are, uh, they're a little burdensome there. It involves a, a chess band and uh, two wristbands, uh, and you have to have a dedicated phone because we're collecting uh, the stream of all the sensor data coming off and it's being processed on the phone, so the phone has to be dedicated to all the sensor streams. And the, these uh, wearable chess band Wristbands, they're used to classify stress at every minute. Um, and the push that's being investigated in this particular application, this, this trial will also go into the field probably at the exact same time. They're going to all go in. It's, um, it's whether or not we remind you to use uh, self-stress management exercises that, ex that are on your phone already and that you've been taught to use. This uh, is... Uh, uh, for people who are trying to quit smoking. So the whole goal is to delay the time until they relapse or prevent relapse, in, in, in fact. Here, it's just very simple push. At any given minute of a 10-hour day, if your stress, if we can make a stress classification, we might push uh, a reminder. Um, so this is a side comment before I go on to the experimental design. This is something, if you've heard me talk about this, Ben has heard me, uh, this is something I tried very hard to avoid for a long time. But the more you get into mobile health, the more you realize the issue of availability is paramount. And it's because of the intrusive nature of these treatments. So we can only de deliver a treatment if the individual is, an ava is available. So let's go to the physical activity study, the one we already run. In that study, uh, if uh, one of the classifiers on the phone indicates that you might be driving, operating a vehicle, we consider you unavailable because we don't want to disrupt you from your driving. If you're currently walking uh, in the heart step study, we also consider you unavailable because we don't want to ping you and suggest that you go on a different kind of walk when you're already walking. The other way in which you become unavailable in this study, and this is now common across all of our studies, is that at any given time, 
in this case, here, you compress this middle button and you can turn off the intervention entirely for a given period of time. So the user has control. The user decides, I just, I want privacy. So I had an NIH review committee meeting. I turned it off for the whole day, that sort of thing. So no matter what, when one analyzes this data, thinks about it, one has to always remember the issue of availability is down there. And of course, why you're available, the reason you may be available may be impacted by how you were treated in the past. OK, I, I already showed you this slide. I just want to remind you of this as we go to the trial design. Uh, again, when I think about these trial designs, I'm always saying there's these two things. We have two objectives. Uh, because of the nature of the collaboration that's going on, both informing behavioral science and behavior change, as well as can we, can we develop treatment policies that might tell us how to roll this out in the future. So uh, what we've done is we've, we've developed something that we call uh, a micro-randomized trial. And uh, uh, there is another, uh, if you're in reinforcement learning, this is akin to using a behavior policy. Um, so in a micro-randomized trial, at each decision point, so we saw cases on those prior slides where I had daily decision points, I had five <laughs> decision points per day, I had minute decision points at every minute, all kinds of variety of types of intervals of time for which we have decision points. At each decision point, you do a randomization. So uh, you have certain uh, space of treatments you can provide and you randomize among those treatments. And that, there's some algorithm that determines that randomization, and it may depend on all the data that you've collected on that participant up to that time. It certainly will only occur if the person is currently available. So you won't even get randomized if, a per if you're not currently available. So for example, in the first version of Heart Steps, uh, the activity suggestions could be provided uh, at, at five decision times per day. It was a 42-day study, so it's 210 times that one might be randomized. Uh, other, time, other studies like the smoking cessation is thousands of times. So how might these algorithms, or how to even think about these algorithms that do the randomization? Well, sometimes they're really simple. And we're going to see an example, not in the next slide, but the uh, second to next. So I'm going to go through these challenges. And I'll, as I said, I'll first talk about experimental design. And it's all in the context of this micro-randomized trial. I am positive there are better experimental designs. Um, and then I'll, I'll go on to some other challenges, the whole issue of how you define your response. This is really complicated in this setting. And if you work in reinforcement learning, you know that's pervasive throughout that entire field of how we define the reward or the response. Non-stationarity, we'll talk about that. And then um, the need for multiple treatment policies. So first, uh, experimental design. So in some cases, it's trivial. So in the first heart steps, we, um, we had five decision times a day at which we might push an activity, a tailored activity suggestion to you. Um, and we knew that uh, in, in team invest, uh, discussions, we thought, well, people will probably be OK with around three suggestions per day. Done. So the randomization is with probability 0.6, we randomize you to a suggestion, 0.4, we don't. That was the <coughs> so the, the, there's no algorithm here. It's just based on perceptions of, uh, of burden on the participants. In the second study, the one that will go into the field at the end of April, is uh, uh, I want to talk about the anti-sedentary messages. So those can only, they're only that might be pushed to you if you've currently been sedentary. So the sensors have detected that you're currently been sedentary at least for 30 minutes. Then you're able to get a push. So how do we, and we, the team decided around one and a half messages at sedentary times. So how do you do that? Well, you have to be really careful, as you can well imagine, or you'll accidentally give your, your one and a half or two messages at, every morning, right? So you need to predict over, continually re-predict as the day goes along how many more sedentary periods there are going to be remaining in the day and spread out the randomization probability across the day. 
so that after the study's over, you look at the times at which there was a push, it's sort of uniform across the day. And that's exactly what we do here. We have very um, primitive algorithms for doing this. Um, I am sure that someone could do a better job at this sort of thing. Uh, here we had the heart steps, the first heart steps had a, a pretty rich data for us to do it. So I think we uh, were able to build a more flexible model, a prediction model. These are models that are incremental. So you use the last day's prediction, the last decision time's prediction to figure out what the next decision time's prediction is and the next one, you know, they're, they're incremental in time. But the weights in the algorithm are determined from the prior data. So there's no active learning of the weights in that prediction. Uh, that could be a problem here. Uh, in the sense to stop study, uh, there we wanted, it was again, for some reason, one, around one and a half reminders. Now, when you're currently stressed, currently classified as stressed, uh, and around one and a half reminders when you're currently classified as not stressed. So in this case, we only had a very small data set, so we had to build a complete fictional model, a Markovian model, and then produce a prediction algorithm. Uh, in both of these studies, uh, we're going to, of course, we'll run a couple of people at first and see how well our algorithms are predicting, and then we may have to tune the algorithms, and then they get set in stone, the algorithms get set. I, I, I was supposed to mention this earlier. I think it's really important. In the world I live in, which is a clinical trial world, everything must be set in stone. So all the tuning parameters for all these algorithms, they have to be set ahead of time. I cannot halfway through the study decide I want to change things. These studies, I have to be able to maintain some idea of replicability. People need to be able to replicate whatever we do. Uh, so in the, so again, let's go back to the heart step study again. The second version, the one that's going to go in the field. So uh, I just talked about the anti-sanitary messages uh, and then the smoking cessation study. But now we're back to the activity suggestion. Okay, let me make, I, I, I gotta make sure that everybody's with me on this. We had activity suggestions in the first heart step study. Now we're going to the second study and we're gonna do activity suggestions again. Now, we're going to randomize it differently. We're going to use a banded algorithm to randomize. So this is how I view a banded algorithm. It's a way to do randomization. In particular, we're using Thompson sampling, and the Thompson sampling provides us pro posterior probabilities that one action is better than another, and you use those probabilities to do the randomization. Um, we use a prior based on the old data. Can you give me a one-minute me morning? Yeah. Um, there are some, a lot of issues when you do this sort of thing. Remember, uh, the behavioral scientists, they want to be able to inform their science. So we can't have this bandit algorithm move the probabilities too close, or too, too close to zero or too close to one. Because then someone after the study can't analyze whether or not the treatments had an effect at those times. We're precluding our collaborators from doing their analyses if we allow the banded algorithm to move too close to zero, probabilities to move too close to zero or one, thus the clipping. It's not only that. The reason why the banded algorithm might go too close to one or zero might be for completely inappropriate reasons. Why is that? Because the reward, the natural reward is the Step count in the subsequent 30 minutes. That's the natural thing because that's the target of this activity suggestion. However, if there's no effect of the activity suggestion, what's the bandit going to do? It's going to act on noise. Right? Or if there's a temporary effect of the activity suggestion and then it dissipates, Again, the banded algorithm will just get that little effect at best or act on noise, and then it just runs off in one direction. We can't have that happen. So again, the whole choice of how you use a reward in this type of a setting that uh, projects into the future the consequences of giving too much treatment, that's critical. And we're still right in the middle of trying to operationalize the reward for this uh, algorithm.
It's going to inv involve the thumbs up and thumbs down uh, indicators for sure. Um, I just want to point out, this is going to be another point. Um, if you want to, after the study, this is when all the excitement on the behavioral science comes in. You know, they're really excited to analyze this data. We are too because we might use it as batch data to form a policy. Um, but every single push, you can have multiple kinds of pushes in Heart Steps. Uh, the second version of Heart Steps, the, uh, it has like five or six different types of pushes all at different time scales. Each one has its own proximal response. So here are the activity suggestions, 30 minutes following randomization. The anti-sedentary messages, five minutes following randomization. Um, in the sense, it's not only that, sometimes the context the suggestion is provided in determines the response. So in the smoking cessation study, if you're currently stressed, the intervention is intended to help you manage that stress at that moment. If you're not currently stressed, it's intended to help you prevent future stress episodes. I don't know how the R, you know, the, we need, the RL guys, we need y'all. I mean, someone needs to think carefully about all of this. And the fact that we have so many different kinds of pushes at different time scales, how do you have policies that bring all of that together? And you have to account for availability. And you have to make sure you don't mess up the causal inference. Okay, I am so like out of time, time so I'm going to skip non-stationarity. Uh, I will say that uh, the behavioral science behind this is that there's multiple causal pathways towards maintaining safe physical activity. Each push is designed to act on a different pathway. The response here is a mediator often, very interesting, or a, pro or a surrogate outcome, very interesting. Um, and it's not only that, you have the different time scales, and you also should do engagement policies as well to keep people engaged enough in the intervention so the treatment pushes can back off when they don't have to, but you can continue to collect data so they can come back in when the person needs it. Last, I'll go to the last slide. Um, there's pictures of all, a whole bunch of collaborators. We have computer scientists here, behavioral scientists, human computer 